when I saw Bitcoin, it was very, very clear that it was actually way more rarer and special than anything that I've seen. Like you had an anonymous founder who not only solved a math fields medal worthy problem, but also solved an economics game theoretical problem to make it happen in the world. Who was also politically sophisticated and not attract attention in the early years. He actually said no to WikiLeaks using Bitcoin. So it is just like fascinating, insanely fascinating. He just thought nine moves deep. Once the source code is built, Bitcoin source code has never been changed till date. And it still continues to operate. It is just one of the most fascinating economic experiments in history. Few possess a rare combination of exceptional talent, entrepreneurial vision, and a relentless drive to push boundaries. My next guest on the Warmson Project is Prasanna Sankar. The co-founder of Rippling is undoubtedly one such individual. In 2010, Prasanna co-founded Like a Little, a college campus network that experienced an incredible surge skyrocketing from 0 to 20 million views within six weeks. Prasanna's coding prowess has earned him international recognition. Furthermore, during his college years, Prasanna held the esteemed rank 1 position at Top Coder, solidifying his status as a true coding prodigy. In part 1 of this two-part series, listen in to learn about Prasanna's journey from Top Coder to Microsoft, strategies from building and optimizing for pace and efficiency, views on the future of crypto, the valuable lessons learned along the way that help him identify the next big thing, and much more. Subscribe to the show wherever you're listening to it, and sign up to the 1% Project's Think newsletter at 1%.live that adds value to your professional and personal life. Stay till the end, where I summarize the key takeaways from the conversation with Prasanna. Let's talk about early life. How was it growing up in India and how has that journey been? Yeah, India definitely teaches hustle and competition like no other. And uh, obviously it's highly competitive. I fell in love with computers early on and that was my ticket out of this massive competition. And computers also happen to be like a new field where you can have a meritocratic test, you know, without any biases or somewhat because it's a new field, it's hard to pre-prepare and game as well. So I had a green field opportunity. I did a lot of these programming contests when I was young and I was ranked one in India at that time when I was 18 years old. So that was my ticket out of like extreme competition, which was this new sort of sector or field, which was changing the world, which was fairly early at that time. And these new programming contests that were also fairly new. They only happened after Google put in place a Google Code Jam and that a nice ticket out of extreme competition which is college grades and stuff. Looking back, doubling down on Top Coder makes sense but at that time, you chose to actually focus on Top Coder versus university. Yeah. So how did you decide on that? I was good at one and interested in one and not good at the other and not interested in the other. And being right about that gave me a lot of confidence to make bigger and bigger bets later on. The same thing happened when I was in schools during my grade 12 exam. A lot of my families came in and said, hey, listen, this is, you need to really do well here because your future depends on it. And I was always sitting on my computer. I fell in love with me, in love with computer as an outlet. People wanted me to prepare for academics and stuff. And turned out that betting on computers at that time was the right bet. So I had a little bit of early confidence that, you know, you just follow what you want to do and you can go places. And then Top Coder was like a natural extension of that. Yeah, maybe you should not bet on what everyone is betting on. And that theme has evolved with me over my life and gave me bigger, better confidence to make bigger and bigger bets on contrarian things. And I think that is actually kind of true of a lot of people at the highest performing areas where I see them as like a continuous breakout. Each time they have a outlier moment, they've done something amazingly well. That momentum just compounds in their life. They just get more confidence and they make bigger and bigger bets. And the extreme case of that is someone like Elon or Sam Altman who are making 10-year bets, which are absurd and crazy. 
that is sort of the extreme version of delayed gratification. You touched upon a great point. Early on confidence of building some early on wins even in early life actually helps you better judge certain decisions and also gives you the ability to be more flexible in taking decisions which could be outside the norm. And it's also once you've done that and you feel proud about that, like it is extremely hard to go back into the matrix and operate normally. Tell us about your journey to Microsoft and how was the experience at Microsoft? I did a, did really well in these programming contests, got a job at Google very early. And Google was an extremely prestigious job back in the days. They didn't do much hiring. They didn't even have an India office back in the day or it was fairly new. They never came to my campus for recruiting. I went to one of the top schools in India, National Institute of Technology, Trichy, and Google wasn't hiring from that. I got a job there like fairly young, third year or something where nobody has ever gotten even their regular jobs. So I was like famous in college. People called me Google Prasanna. That was Google was my dream job. Um, I, when I went to Google International Code Jam to their headquarters when I was 18, I was like looking around. Everyone was rich. Everyone was a millionaire. They were ch chilling around near the pool. And I asked my folks around like, why aren't they working? Why, didn't they, why are they chilling near the pool? So it was really my dream job. I wanted to get into Google and I got it. Suddenly when I got it, by the time I was graduating, Microsoft made me like a huge offer. They were building like a team for the Bing search at that time. And they made me like a disproportionately better offer. And I turned down Google and I went to Microsoft. And that was like a very confidence boosting move for me because I grew past my dreams, grew past what I set for myself, which is already like way higher than anyone around has ever accomplished. So it was just like insane for the whole college to imagine someone just says no to Google, like someone who turned them down. And I did that. I, Microsoft was my first job. I thought that would be the most interesting thing because my background was like optimizations, performance and things like that. And they were being, building Bing search and I excelled there initially. I did extremely well. I improved one of their performance by 3.2x, which has just saved them millions of dollars, which I thought was a huge thing. I just came out of campus. I saved them millions of dollars. So I was super proud. I enjoyed it a little bit in the beginning. For the first three months or so, I, I gave it my all. And then post that, I got disillusioned. <laughs> Holy fuck, everyone is moving insanely slowly here. None of them want to do anything. They're, they're lifers here. This is their last job, their first job. And what the heck am I doing here? The code that I wrote over like a few weeks, it took six months, nine months to get in, get checked in. And I was just like, dude, I'm like, my life is just completely wasted from here. So I had to do something. I had to do something else. And I stopped going to work for a long time, actually. And then it took them probably six to nine months to notice that there is a guy who's getting paid, who's just never showing up to work to, and to fire me, actually. <laughs> you talked about pace. The main challenge at Microsoft was pace. So there are two extremes to pace. One is a corporate which wants everything to be secure, understood, documented before they take a step. On the other hand, startups say, let's commit the code. And we'll figure out what happens. Yeah, yeah. I think the right path is actually in the middle. So how do you build and optimize for pace and efficiency? Yeah, I actually think the right path depends on the stage. So I think about evolution of like startups. This is actually an old adage in Silicon Valley. I think Ben Horowitz first said it. I'm probably repeating it. The way to think of a startup is, is let's say you want to conquer Nazi Germany. Like, how do you do it? You first send in the commandos who take insane risks, these James Bond types, they don't coordinate, they don't have a lot of teamwork, so to speak. They go storm the beaches, they distract the watchtowers, they take insane risks, right? This is sort of a pre-product market fit startup. And there's founders, 5% odds of defeating Google is like an opportunity of a lifetime. And then if there is Hitler in a stadium and you have to blow it up and there is going to be millions of civilian casualties, no problem. You do it. So that is sort of the early, and in this case, like the civilians are customers. Early startup products are shitty products. Customers get it. They're so buggy. There is a lot of issues. So the early stage of a company, and I've been there, like my first startup, like a little, it was growing so fast, insanely fast. I remember we were spinning up servers all night, me and my co-founder, and we were like, 
we did it. We did it. Like finally did it. And then we calculated how long will this, we doubled our servers and we calculated how long will this last for. And it was two days. So our traffic was actually doubling every two days. So that was the rate at which that thing was growing. And there was no, you talked about commit and then see what happens. We weren't even committing. I was editing code in production. I restart the server and see what happens. That was an insane time. I was sleeping two hours a day. So I've seen that extreme as well. I think it's like the right tool for the job and like what your problems are, what your biggest risks are and you're always trading off. And then to complete the analogy and there is post product market fit when you're like really high growth, there it's like the military sort of comes in, they storm the beach. They're still taking risks, but they're taking like where the odds of success is like 30 to 80%, somewhere in that range. There is some level of team coordination, but there is also decent amount of autonomy. There is like small units of like 10 people, 15 people. Within them, they have coordination, they have some order, but then the teams are like fairly autonomous themselves. They're going fighting their own front lines. And then finally, the last stage is the cops. When you've already captured the land, you have to set order in it. You have to tame the chaos in it. And then you get the Google Microsoft territory where you just preserve the territory. You have a lot of customers. Your job is to provide a stable experience for the customers. There are tools for the job. And at Rippling, for example, obviously we are in the military stage. It's a post-product market fit, fast-growing company, which is like doubling year on year and so on. So there is a lot of chaos. But there are parts of the product where our customers demand excellence. Just no chaos, no mistakes. For example, our payroll system. So there is, there is a lot of process before something happens there. People need to get paid on time. That's way more important to our customers than how fast things change, how much features evolve. And then you see it even at the extremes, like Elon's company. Can you think of Elon's company being run by the cops? But there are parts of SpaceX that are run by the cops. Like, for example, even today, like you have the NASA mission, which is launching people to space. And that is using five-year-old rockets. This technology, that's using five-year-old technology, Falcon 9s, not the latest one, which is like the BFRs. So five years to ship to production. Is what you're seeing there. So even in Elon's company, some places operate like cops. What you're getting at is that in a mature company, there are parts which definitely need a very regimented way of management. And there could be parts which could move faster, which are basically in development. And it completely depends on what the customer needs are and what growth stage the product is. Totally. Totally. You talked about like a little... Let's talk about the journey and what made you decide not to take the 100 million acquisition offers that you were getting from Google and Facebook? So one of our biggest investors is Mark Andreessen. I was Mark Andreessen. He was on the board of Facebook at that time. And we were growing so fast. Like at that time, we had 20% of all US college students using the site. So we had, I think, around 10 to 20 million users. Okay. So we were getting like, five to ten dollars per user and facebook was making that much every year so if we just turned on ads for one year the site didn't die which in retrospect was a bad bet (laughs) site did die but if the site didn't die for a year and we just turned on ads like we could have made that money in theory i mean it depends on for advertising you need to do a lot it's not possible to build it within that time frame but that was the theory, was that it was still extremely underpriced. And the mark was like, this could be the next Facebook. We want to take a shot at it or not. And we wanted to take a shot at it. I think that was the right poker move for the cards in our hand. It was a little bit emotional, but it's okay. It was the right decision with the information known at that time. Perhaps one year later, it was clear that it was the wrong decision. But you didn't have the information at that time. And then now looking back, I still feel it's the right decision. It is what led me to accumulate like a billion dollars. You can't fold. You have to keep doubling down on the things that are working. So what was that piece of information that wasn't existent a year ago when you made that decision? So what changed? We lost users. The product itself was a social product. It was a social flirting app. And two thirds of our users were actually women which was surprising to me. They were shy to talk in person. So they used the app to express their crush. And they expressed their crush once, thrice, one month, two months, three months. And then at some point they ran out. And this is a product which is surprisingly, it 
keeps happening. Every two years, three years, there is a super hit company that builds the same product and goes insanely viral, becomes the top app on the app store and it dies. I've watched this play out many times. After like a little few years later, there was Yik Yak. There was an app called Yik Yak that rose to fame and died again. Founders there had a benefit of hindsight. So they cashed out like a lot, like $20 million or something. They took out a lot of secondaries. And then the third time this happened uh, is uh, there's a guy called Nikita Bayer who sold an app and he had insane benefit of hindsight. So he actually just sold the whole company at the peak to Facebook, which Facebook shut down. And then he came out and started the same company once again called Gas. And then, like two years, three years later, it happened again when a new batch of college students come in the app works again and he sold it again to some company for $50 million or something. So it is one of the oddest things that I've seen in my life. People keep starting it. People keep investing in it. People keep buying it only to shut it down. What are your views on Meta, Microsoft, Bing and Google in the present day scenario, given that you've seen the decisions that they have made in the last 10, 20 years? Who do you think is the most well-positioned going forward? I'm actually very bearish on them, mostly because everyone is bullish on them. For a lot of periods, if you go back and study the NASDAQ, you have periods where insane monopolies accumulate and a large portion of NASDAQ or the S&P is taken over by these monopolies. And it is always different themes at different times. There are the chemical companies in the 70s. And at each point in time, these companies look invincible at around like 30-40% of NASDAQ, like they somehow die. They just happen to die. And we're already seeing chinks in the armor. For example, we are seeing Google's business, what's going to happen with the LLM threat. You know, I think it's a little bit overblown, but still, once these companies were viewed as unbreakable, you're starting to see some threats. Meta is in a similar situation. It's completely turning over its entire business. Like it stopped growing for the first time and it's completely making a new bet because it's existential for Meta. It is trading at very low multiples of cash flows today, probably 10, 15 at best. So market is sort of, I mean, it stopped growing. So market is betting that it's the last 10, 15 years of meta. It could be wrong, but we are already seeing these companies go from invincible trillions of dollars in market cap to getting hammered quite a bit. And Amazon is another similar story. It has been underrated for a long time. And then suddenly for a brief moment, it got overrated and probably still is. It has still not made a profit. It has still not shown extreme free cash flows. Cloud was supposed to be the one thing that produced drove a lot of profits. Now that got competed away. On one hand, I do agree that it is in the nature of software that all this wealth got created. Like I got extremely rich because of this software thing where to distribute one extra unit of software, to put one more user on the software that you've written, it costs zero. Right? And that's what sort of rained trillions on Bill Gates. He was the first software company, Microsoft. And with the internet, that has gotten really accelerated quite a bit. You now see, because the cost of the extra user is zero, capitalism's equilibrium is everyone uses the best software. Why should anyone use the second best? So it creates a natural consolidation effect and the winners really do take all, even without any network effects. Network effects also exist on the internet and that creates powerful companies. But even without network effects, the brands are so strong here that it produces insane consolidation effects. And that's what created the fangs and the trillion dollar market caps. And it's unsustainable. They're getting attacked from all sides right now. Like US hates it because it influences US politics and stuff like that. These guys have gotten too powerful. They're almost monopolies. The other countries hate it. Europe hates it because like they're the rent they're the sort of indirect taxers of the internet and they don't pay any taxes to Europe. Money all runs away into tax havens. So like Europe completely hates it because the wealth creation didn't happen there. So they don't enjoy the market cap gains the way US gains it. They don't pay any, not even any taxes. So it's almost like a pipe that sucks away money from Europe and adds no net benefit to Europe other than maybe people like using the Facebook product or something. So Europe hates it. China has like a nice take on it. China hates it. They wall their garden and say, you guys fuck off. I'll make my own version. And that worked fabulously. So now Europe is looking like a fool. Like Europe and India, which had open markets, we believed in open markets. We look like a fool because all the market cap got created in the US disproportionately benefited. 
and all we see in our economy is a taxation. Our views of politics get shaped somewhere in the Twitter headquarters in San Francisco. Who needs to win the Indian elections get shaped there. And Europe hates it for similar reasons. So it's like an indirect takeover of the US uh, on all these countries' sovereignty. There is just like lots of ways by which these guys are getting attacked. And the way by which these guys are getting attacked that I am most bullish on, that I am betting, I'm going to bet a good portion of my rest of my life and my fortunes on, is actually crypto. Now, crypto is the way by internet users can band together and pick out these rent seekers and decentralize this whole thing. Facebook and Amazon can charge a huge rent and command a huge market cap only because they control a private instance of MySQL which hosts all the data that they only they have root access. They can change the rules of the game on that MySQL at any point in time whereas blockchains provide an alternative where the MySQL is just completely decentralized and no one can change the rules of the game. It is just run by open source foundations. So I think that's the new internet and the attack that they pose is severely underestimated and it's going to strike within the next 10 years. It's going to be like fundamental to these guys' business models that the world is going to change fairly fast. Somebody has said it well, that great products and great leaders always polarize. So you see the polarization on crypto. How do you see that panning out in the next 10 years? I think crypto had a great 10 years or 14 years, somewhere in that range. What an amazing time it has been. Like I remember I bought my first Bitcoin in 2012. This was when I was running like a little. I had only $10,000 to my name and I came across the Bitcoin white paper and I was just like mind blown. One thing I've learned to develop over these sort of multiple bets which turned out to be right, which took me to the right place at the right time, was to identify when something special is happening in the world. Starting from top coder, the next one was like Y Combinator, and then it was like a little. And then when I saw Bitcoin, it was very, very clear that it was actually way more rarer and special than anything that I've seen. Like you had an anonymous founder who not only solved a math fields medal worthy problem, but also solved an economics game theoretical problem to make it happen in the world, who was also politically sophisticated and not attract attention in the early years. He actually said no to WikiLeaks using Bitcoin. So it is just like fascinating, insanely fascinating. He just thought nine moves deep. Once the source code is built, Bitcoin source code has never been changed till date. And it still continues to operate. It is just one of the most fascinating economic experiments in history. So I put half my liquid net worth is $5,000 into Bitcoin at $100 a Bitcoin back in the day. It was special back then. I was a Bitcoin maximalist. And I missed a lot of the intermediate things that were happening in crypto. The rise of Ethereum, the DeFi, the proof of stake. I thought a lot of these won't work, which happened to work. And that is what sort of brought me back, gave me slaps on my face saying, wake up, dude, wake up, you're wrong. Your predictions were wrong. No, it's not Bitcoin that's winning. Ethereum has already won. Proof of stake has already won over proof of work. It doesn't matter that this problem didn't get solved for 75 years. As soon as it got solved, within the next five years, there is a way more elegant, efficient solution that actually works. So it is just a narrative violation for me. I just didn't believe that would happen. It happened. So crypto has come a long way. It's almost unstoppable at this point. And Satoshi was smart enough to recognize, even in his white paper on his, or in his forum posts, that the final boss on the Super Mario game is actually the nation states, the governments. And we are meeting the final boss now. The governments are coming out guns blazing. Crypto has lost a lot of its core ethos due to this attack. And it's going to get worse. One of my friends, Matt Cohen, who I've known for 10 years, he started out with $10,000 at similar time. He's the one who spoke to me passionately about Bitcoin when I, when I saw it in 2012. He had 100% of his net worth in Bitcoin at that time. So he's the one, he's probably the Warren Buffett of crypto. He converted $10,000 into a billion dollars over the last seven, eight years. And today you cannot create another MetaCoin in crypto because the markets have significantly closed off. US is attacking the launch of any new tokens. Metacon didn't have any connections. He was just a random dude on the internet who was just reading and was curious. And all these coins that he bought, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Polkadot, all of these had public launches. Anyone could have bought in on the day that they got launched. We no longer live in that world. We live in a world where Anderson Horowitz, Connors, 
ten percent of any of the most important tokens out there. And there, you know, all these sort of things are happening in the private. Much of the growth is happening on the private rounds where you need access, people need to know you, and so on and so forth. You know, we lost a lot of the decentralization ethos due to the attack by the government. Some of the players who stood and fought, like Tornado Cash, are shut down. Founders thrown in jail. Things have escalated quite a bit. The stakes are dramatically higher. And in fact. The irony is, I think what's actually going to happen, the next bull run, the biggest catalyst of it is going to be the government. So I think what is going to happen from here, the next few moves are, governments are going to block, ban crypto the way they can. Most people will try in some way or the other. And then they're also going to say, crypto is bad, blockchain is good. I'm going to embrace the blockchain. And they're going to launch their CBDC, Central Banking Digital Currencies. And what they don't realize is that is actually going to be the wave that creates the next 10x in crypto market caps. That is going to push the adoption of crypto from the current 5% to 50%. That is going to be the internet moment. Because going back in history, if you look at 1970, 1980, Steve Jobs ran an ad saying, welcome IBM, seriously. He ran a first page ad when IBM entered the PC markets. And he had graphs and charts in that ad which showed that each time on a platform, when, in, when the old incumbent comes in and tries to win market share on that platform, that just grows the market a lot. And that happened as soon as IBM entered and they spent like a billion dollars in marketing saying, you, you got to buy a PC at your home. Everyone took it seriously. IBM had such a brand and suddenly consumers realized, okay, maybe I should buy a PC in my house. And then they went searching, what is the best PC to buy? And Apple... Computer sales took off. It 10 x on the back of not Apple spend, but IBM spend. Just the way Steve Jobs predicted. And that's what's going to happen once people enter the CBDC and they understand, oh, I need to hold a wallet. Why do I need to hold a wallet? You can use decentralized apps. You can decentralized exchange things. It's instant settlement. Once they understand it, then it is going to be harder and harder to have two internets. One is the local bubble, which is all the apps built on top of CBDC and the global bubble, which is the apps that are cross-national, there is going to be one bridge, there is going to be some leakage somewhere. And then these two worlds connect and that sort of brings in the next billion users into crypto. That's an amazing breakdown, but it also feels that it is a very long game. Absolutely. Totally. So you talked about being an early adopter of Top Coder, Y Combinator, like a little, and crypto. So is there a mechanism that you follow in understanding what's next or things come to you and then you recognize that this could be the next big thing? One of the most important things that people underrate, I believe, is the toil of walking in the desert. I've probably been in the desert for the longest in the sense that I wasn't good at academics. So there was just like lots of periods where I just had downtime. I just wasn't doing anything. I was just trying to go from one curiosity to the other. And then when you have a lot of your free time opened up, then, you know, your curiosity is free to wander and look at what is interesting out there. And then that's what clicked computers for me. And when Microsoft didn't work out for me, uh, I just didn't go to work for, I don't know, six months, nine months, something like that. And I just had a lot of time to, I stumbled across Paul Graham's blog posts and so on and so forth. So obviously to have a free mind is actually pretty important to note that. And then if you've sort of walked in the desert without water, you've gone through for a while in the traditional paths and you found nothing interesting and you didn't engage fully heartfelt deeply into it. Like I didn't engage in academics or Microsoft and so on. Then you know, okay, what is ordinary? And then you're looking for something that's special. And what is special often in the early days is actually very explosive. It becomes one of the most insanely obvious no-brainers that no one could, why would anyone say no to? For example, if you take top coder, you can either study four years, top year college, and try to get a job at Yahoo. Or you do really well in these programming contests. And before you finish college, you got a job at Google which paid two times more or something like that. Everyone knew they wanted the Google, not the Yahoo. Yet nobody was doing these programming contests. It just was like, even two steps of connecting the world is hard to do. And it becomes extreme no-brainer when you look at it. 
if you just look at it with a clear mind. Another thing was YC, Y Combinator. I was bored of Microsoft and I was coming across Paul Graham's blog posts. And he had a very provocative claim that Bill Gates would have been rich no matter with or without Microsoft. He would have made millions, not billions. And he would have had fuck you money anyway. And I was like, dude, like if you can do that in almost like a guaranteed manner within a few five, 10 years of your life, why would you work at Microsoft and climb the rating ladder and try to get 10% raises and so on? It just seemed like a no-brainer. And then the stats were showing it. YC had already started by then. And PG had a metric that he was measuring at the time called founder millionaire rate. The rate at which founders were becoming millionaires. And million dollars was a lot of money back then. You could just retire off of it. And the founder millionaire rate of YC was 50%. So literally half the founders were becoming millionaires. Like, why would anyone not do that and work for a big company like that that's that seemed insane like you you can flip a coin and if the coin lands heads you never have to work a day in your life and you can keep flipping or you can work for 30 years 50 years i don't know that's nuts so the early ones when you have an explosive growth where things are changing the world like that there are early signs that it's just a complete no-brainer there is just like nothing to even think twice about and it happens a lot anytime there is a for example when uber came to india there was a time when drivers were making 2 lpm 2 lakhs per month before that they were making 20000 a month you suddenly had this new thing that came out like why wouldn't you drive uber why would you drive your regular auto so that's what these sort of explosive changes in the world creates especially for early participants of the bubble so often times i think one is to be free enough to notice these things when these things are happening, to be available, to not get bogged down by commitments and things like that, that you can't change your life on a whim. And when Rippling happened, Rippling is the one that made me a billion dollars. It was the ultimate no-brainer. There was a company called Zenefits, which I was a part of. I was privy to what made it work, what didn't make it work. And it went from zero to $50 million in two years. And the company collapsed, not because of market conditions, but because of suicide just like mismanagement. And when the company collapsed, no one was coming in for that price. It's likely a $100 billion price because those revenue growth numbers indicate that. So it's a $100 billion price. It's almost like Google collapsing. There is clearly a demand. Yet for some structural reasons in the market, nobody was able to enter into that market. The big guys couldn't enter because they were all vertical players. For them to even compete with benefits, they had to build two or three products which stretched them thin. They were already suffering from overgrowth because of the changes that benefits introduced in the market. So they, they couldn't go from, they all just went from one to three products, like such a massive company that's huge for them. They can't go from one to 10 products now. So the big guys couldn't compete. The sm small startups couldn't compete because you had to build a lot of products before you can go to market. You, we had to burn $10 million before we went to market. So the small startups were priced out. So it, due to some peculiar Goldilocks conditions, <laughs> Rippling was just super special. It was just obvious that it's going to make billions, make me billions and billions of dollars. I just picked a billion dollars off the road. And I said as much to anyone I met, any of the early employees I tried to convince to join me early on. And the irony was, it didn't work for the people who are the Googlers and the traditional people, although that would have changed their life the most. But the people who actually got convinced are startup founders. They were running perfectly fine startups. They could have raised millions of dollars on their own startups. They were accomplished entrepreneurs. They threw it away for a few percentage points of rippling, 1% or something of rippling. And that was the right bet to make. Even though their stakes were much higher, they were able to see it much more clearer. And they made hundreds of millions of dollars on this bet. It was the right bet to make. So. The early Rippling team turned out to be a lot of ex-entrepreneurs who could, on their own might, raise millions of dollars in venture capital for their own company. Instead, they chose to work as an employee at Rippling, which was actually the right bet to make in retrospect. And so in a weird way, you know when that's happening. You just have to not come up with excuses. When we started Rippling, I just had my first son born. Like, I couldn't spend a lot of time with him when we were founding Rippling. But it is what it is. It is the price to pay. 
these things don't happen all the time. I hope you enjoyed the conversation with Prasanna. Here are the three takeaways from this conversation. Number one, betting on one's passion and embracing contrarian thinking can lead to extraordinary opportunities and pave the way for continued personal growth and success. Number two, once individuals achieve something significant and experience a sense of pride early on, settling for conventional or mundane things is difficult. Number three, the observations of early signs of explosive growth and disruptive changes happen when one has a free mind, a willingness to explore different areas, is open to curiosity and available to take action. If you enjoyed this episode, share it with someone who will find it valuable. For any recommendations and feedback, you can drop me a line at pritish at the rate 1%.live that is P-R-I-T-I-S-H at the rate O-N-E-P-E-R-C-E-N-T dot L-I-V-E. Until next time.